A method is a special kind of function defined inside of a class. And once it's defined, every object of that class's type has some new built-in functionality associated with it. Methods are one of the superpowers of object-oriented programming, and that's where the paradigm gets its name from. We'll look at why in just a moment. You've actually already encountered methods before when you've used a list and you said list.append to add a new item to your list, list.append to add another new item to your list, list.pop. You are calling methods on list objects in the process of doing so. Well, in this lesson, we're going to look at how do we define our own methods on our own classes such that we can build extra capabilities and functionality into every object of our class's type. Let's jump right in to a coding exercise. And we're going to set up a file named ls38 underscore methods.py in your lessons directory. Okay. And go ahead and jot down the code that you're seeing here. And we'll talk about uh, everything we've got and then continue from here to introduce our very first method in just a moment. All right, so let's break down what we've got here on our screen, and hopefully you've had a moment to think about it. So we're starting out with the definition of a class named person. And this person class has two attributes associated with it, a name and an age. An age has a default value of zero. Next, we're seeing the de definition of a constructor function, right? Or a constructor method we'll see after this video. And this construction or this constructor method is a subject we introduced in the last lesson. So if you missed that lesson, pause the video here, uh, open up a new tab, go watch that video. It's linked to right above, right? We need to know what a constructor is in order to understand the code that we're working with here. And we'll take that information and uh, apply it to the understanding of a method, which we'll look at in today's, in this lesson. You see that the constructor has a parameter named name and that parameter is being used to fully initialize the attribute named name of a brand new person object. So in our main function, we're seeing that we're setting up a variable named person A that is gonna to refer to a new person object that gets constructed with a name attribute of Joe, right? So by defining that constructor, we're able to construct a new person object. Its age will be initially zero. It's a brand new baby Joe being born into our program. Uh, zero age, uh, zero years old, and with a name of, of Joe that we initialized upon construction. When we print out the name, we should just see Joe printed to the screen to confirm that this uh, program is in working order. So I'm gonna go ahead and try running Python from my terminal and we're going to run it as a module and we're looking at lessons.ls38 underscore methods right and joe gets printed all right big deal well what if we wanted to give uh, a person the ability to say hello some extra functionality a simple little method let's define a function or something that looks like a function we'll learn is actually a method named say hello and it will have a single parameter for now named self and return none right and uh Greet the user is the doc string we'll give as the documentation here. And we'll just do something very simple. We'll say print and we'll give an F string of uh, hello, right? Okay. Now, uh, you may see that your editor is giving you a hint saying, hey, you didn't actually use this F string uh, in any meaningful way. So we don't have to define it as an F string, but I'm gonna leave that there because we will come back and, and parameterize or, or use some placeholders in our F string in just a moment, right? But for now, this function uh, is, a, is a method because we're defining it inside of a class. And the other important attribute of, of this being a method in Python is that it has a special first parameter named self just like our constructor did, all right? So same concept, but it's gonna work a little bit differently. Okay, how do we actually use this method? Well, you've used a method before where you've said the object name or your variable name, and then you say dot, and you'll notice that if we are addressing our object named person A, we see that it has two attributes, age and name, and then, oh, there's our method named say hello. All right, so I, uh, I'm gonna select say hello, and this is a uh, method that has no extra parameters, right? We're not uh, giving any extra pieces of information to this method call. We're just saying person A, say hello. All right, so I'm gonna save my program, and let's try uh, running this example. And what do you know? Hello gets printed. Now that's kind of interesting. It seems like there's something uh, happening here that is allowing this special function defined inside of a person class to be called via 
the name of some object of that same class, a dot, and then this function name or this method name. So let's take a look at how this works and uh, try and distinguish what are the differences between a function and a method. And then we'll come back and add some extra capabilities to this and make a, a, a better use of this being a method to show you what's really special about them. Right? So in methods, the way that you define one is it looks a lot like a function definition, except you're going to define it inside of a class's body. Right? So you're going to have to indent this so that it uh, in Python belongs to that class's definition and give it a name, which is an identifier, just like your variable names or function names. The first parameter is going to be self, and this will be important for de uh, defining an, a method that you can call an objects of this class. We'll look at exactly what self is bound to when any method call occurs in just a moment. And then there are going to be some parameters, right? So uh, if we had additional parameters that we wanted our method to take, we could define them as part of our method definition. Methods do have return types, just like functions, so we'll always be defining method return types. And then the method body is where the instructions that will get executed when we call this method will be placed. Right? Once we've defined a method on a given class, we can call that method by having an object available to us. So an object that's bound to say a variable name or that we're accessing in some other way, but a, a reference to an object followed by a dot, and then the method name comes after it with parentheses, and inside of those parentheses, if there were additional parameters defined, we would have to specify additional arguments here, just like any other function call, right? So this is uh, like a function call that's sort of special and has some extra capabilities. So if we wanted to compare, how do we think about a little function versus a method? Well, if we define a silly function, we could say def uh, a function name, say hello, as we're seeing here, and we would call it just by directly uh, using that function's name, say hello, and parentheses, right? Well, with a method, we're saying we're defining this inside of the context of a class's definition, right? And uh, we have to give this special parameter self, and we're not making use of that yet, but we'll see why it's important and why it's so cool in, in uh, another couple of examples. And then once we've uh, defined this method, we're able to call it by having a person object. And right now you're thinking, wow, doesn't this seem like a lot of extra work? Both of these examples required more code than just functions. Well, let's take a look at why methods are important in these next examples and uh, what are the real gains of using them and why are they important to the concept of object-oriented programming. So what I'd like you to try doing to get a feel for this before the big reveal of why they're so cool is go ahead and pause the video here and try following through the instructions on this slide. Update the say hello function to behave as you're seeing here and work a little bit differently printing the object's name and then try constructing another person object in the main function so that you have two person objects with different names and try calling say hello from that object as well. Once you've got that running, unpause the video and we'll continue on uh, with this example. All right, so let's jump right back into it. The goal of this modification is to change the greeting that we're giving uh, or printing out to the screen as part of the say hello method. So hello, uh, if I wanted to carry over the exact example from the slide, hello, I'm, and then self.name. Hello, I'm, and then we're using an F string placeholder here, self.name, right? So we're dropping in this expression and notice we're saying self, and then we're accessing the name attribute of self. And what we can kind of intuit from having previously defined a method named init is self must refer to this object. So name must refer to the attribute of a person object. And we'll look at exactly how self gets bound as a part of this process in just a moment. But let's go ahead and try uh, the, completing this, this exercise by saying, okay, person B is say another person named uh, uh, Jody and uh, person B dot say hello is another method call, right? Now notice this, the method that we're calling on each of these objects is exactly the same. We're not giving it any different uh, arguments. In fact, we're not giving it any arguments at all. The only difference is which object we're calling that method on, right? So let's see if there's any impact when we go and run this, right? So I'm gonna clear my output here and, and let's take a look at this main function and keep the hello uh, method in 
display. So I run this again and notice it says, hello, I'm Joe, hello, I'm Jody. And hopefully that kind of makes intuitive sense, right? Person A was the person we set up to be a person whose name attribute was initialized to Joe. Person A say, hello, hello, I'm Joe. Same idea with person B, person B dot say hello, hello, I'm Jody. Just to convince ourselves that nothing's changed with Joe, we can say person A dot say hello again. And uh, we'll see that sure enough, uh, Joe and Jody are two distinct objects in our program's memory. And when we call the say hello method on either of those objects, the outcome is slightly different, right? It's relative to the object we called the method on. So I'm going to go ahead and delete uh, that line so that we've got two say hello. Uh, and actually, I'm going to only let's change this up for a diagram so that we can understand what's going on. And uh, for the purposes of this diagram, I'm going to have only one example uh, so that we only have a, a few frames to reason through on my screen. All right. And let me see if I can get a little bit more of this to fit. Great. So. How is it that self comes to be a reference to the person object whose name is Joe, right? We, we know that this is going to evaluate to Joe based on having tried running this program, but under the hood, what's actually going on and how does this work? Well, let's try tracing through this with a quick diagram. And I'm gonna move through uh, the setup of the first parts of this diagram really quickly so that we uh, can jump straight to the interesting parts in just a moment. All right, I've gone ahead and set up the main frame, the globals frame, and then uh, the initialization or the construction of the person object whose name is Joe and has an age initially of zero or by default zero. There are a few steps involved in this. I would encourage you pausing the video, trying to trace to this exact same point. And if you have questions on how the construction frame works or the init method call, uh, that happens as a part of the construction of this person object on line 20, then I would encourage watching the previous video and following through with its diagramming before continuing on here, right? So this video is paused at line between lines 20 and 21. We're just about to go evaluate the method call, which is the focus of today's lesson. And if you haven't caught up yet, go ahead and pause here so that we can uh, work through the rest of this together. All right, so we're ready to evaluate this method call. And how do we know that we're working with a method call? Well, uh, we see that we've got the name of an object or the name of a variable that refers to an object, right? So person A, we look at what is person A and we see that it's in our main frame and it's a reference to a person object on the heap, right? So we know that we're working with an object type and its type is person. And then we see a dot and that dot operator says, okay, follow this arrow. And then we see something that looks like a function call. But because we're working within the context of a, the dot operator following the dot operator, this isn't a function call, it's a method call. And when we see a method call, we've got some extra additional rules that we need to follow and be careful of. So one of the first rules that we need to uh, be careful of is we say, okay, well, what type of object are we calling this method on? Now, the, the name of this kind of gives it away, but we could Im imagine this was named uh, a variable that doesn't have the word person in it. And, and notice that it has nothing to do with the name of the variable. It has everything to do with the type of object that we're actually working with, right? So uh, person.a said, follow this arrow and whatever type of object we have here, and in this case, it's something of type person, go look and see if in that class definition, there's a method defined that with the same name. And sure enough, there's this say hello method defined on this class. Now this is an important step because you can actually have the same method name defined on many different classes, right? You could have animals and animals could have a speak method that for a dog might be woof, things like that, right? So uh, methods can, uh, you can have many methods of the same name as long as they're defined in different classes. And in this case, we're working with the say hello method defined in the person class, right? So that, that checks out. Now we see, okay, well, there's this self parameter. Something interesting and is going to have to happen in order to set that up. But otherwise, we don't see any other parameters, and that's okay because we don't see any other arguments as well. So how do we actually evaluate a method call in terms of our memory diagram? Well, we're going to set up a new frame for it, just like it's a function, right? So this is going to be a call to the person 
and uh, class and the method name is say hello, right? Great, and now we need to set up and make sure we're keeping track of our return address. So our return address is line 21, right? This is the line that our method call is occurring on. And next we need to set up our parameters. Well, there's only one parameter and it's the self parameter. This is the magical parameter of a method call. And what is self going to be? Where does it come from? Well, the, whatever object or whatever reference came just before the method call, that is what self is going to refer to. So notice person A in the mainframe, right? Person A up here in the mainframe was an arrow to this person object whose name attribute is Joe. So what we're saying is when a method call occurs, the self parameter is going to be assigned the same reference as whatever uh, was referred to just before the method call occurred. In this case, whatever person A referred to is what self will refer to. So self is also going to refer to this person object. Now remember, the, where these arrows point to on this object are, are immaterial to the purpose of tracing this. We're, we're saying these refer to the same thing, right? So I could have drawn this a little bit more uh, concretely up to the top, it doesn't matter. We're, we're referring to this object in, in general, right? But that's the key step of a method call. Uh, in setting up a frame for a method call, we need to be sure that self is assigned whatever uh, came before the method call, uh, whatever reference came before the method call. And in this case, it was a reference to this person object named Joe. Okay, great. So we're, we're ready to jump in. And then at this point, this is where we uh, reach this print statement. Right? So if I'm keeping track of my output, maybe I'll keep track of my output down here. And uh, we see hello, the string hello. I'm, and then we see this uh, uh, placeholder in our F string and we have to see, well, okay, well, how do we evaluate self.name, right? This is an expression, we need to evaluate it. So we're currently working in the person say hello frame, right? This is the uh, lowest frame on our stack that is yet to return. There's no return value associated with it. And so we say, okay, self is uh, something we know well, what it's defined. That's a defined name. It's bound to this person object. So self dot means follow this arrow to the person object and then look up what is its name attribute. Its name attribute is Joe. So hello, I'm Joe uh, is filled in and there would have been an exclamation point. Uh, and that's the evaluation of this line. When we reach the end of this, this is a method that returns none. It's sort of like a procedural method. And so the return value would be nothing as we have specified before. And where do we go back to line 21? Well, line 21 is the end of our main function call, right? So we're now working in main again. And when we reach the end of our main function call, we're also returning none and going back to line 25. And that's where our program completes, right? So hopefully you can uh, start to appreciate that when we call a method, there's effectively a few extra steps that we'll need to be careful of uh, in, in setting it up in memory and understanding the, the mechanisms which allow it to work. So the first thing we do is we say, okay, uh, we look up what type of object is the, the object we're calling this method on. And so we follow the reference to see that person A referred to a person type. And then we look and see, okay, does, does the person class actually have a method named say, uh, say hello or whatever method uh, we're trying to call? And, and yes, it did in this case. Okay. And then we need to set up a frame for it. The return address works the same. For the name of the frame, we give the class name followed by the method name separated by a hash symbol. And then we're always going to be setting up this first parameter that's special named self. And self is also going to be, or it's going to be a, a, a copy of that pointer from uh, wherever person A pointed to, we're also gonna have the same thing with self, right? And so self will be uh, referred to the exact same object that the method call occurred on, right? And that's what gives us access to the attributes of the object that this method was called on. And this is what in the example, if I were to uh, go modify this example just slightly, right? Uh, so back to where we came from. So person B is assigned a new person object name uh, Jody and person B dot say hello. If we uh, imagine, I'm not gonna, uh, ooh, forgot to know there. Uh, uh, if we imagine that uh, this code was evaluating and I'm not gonna fully evaluate this, right? Because I would need to set up a frame for my constructor and then go set up another frame for the say hello. Um, 
But if we uh, do kind of imagine that somehow, like we know that this construction would result in another person object, and I'm skipping over the frame for initializing this, but there would be a constructor frame for this, and it's the name Jody and the age also zero, right? And uh, there would be uh, another person named person B in mains frame, right? So let me actually change colors here, see if I can uh, make this a little bit easier to read. So let's try, let's try orange, right? So person B would refer to this person object named Jody, and there would have been a frame for the constructor. Now, when we reach this, con this method call, notice that person B refers to a different object. So if we were to think about uh, the say hello frame that would come after these other frames, itself would no longer reference the person object with name Joe, it would reference the person object with name Jody. And that's what allowed the same method calls to the exact same function, or sorry, to the exact same method definition to have different results, right? That's why uh, calling the say hello method on person A resulted in hello, I'm Joe, and the same method on person B, hello, I'm Jody, right? So the superpower of a method is that it automatically or automagically gets a reference to the object the method was called on, right? This is the key fundamental superpower of an object uh, of a method is that it gets the reference to the object it was called on. So a person dot say hello, the object reference is whatever a person refers to and the method being called to say hello. So uh, self would be bound to whatever uh, object a person was bound to, right? When the method call evaluates, that object reference is automatically assigned to the self parameter of the method definition when you jump into it. In the slide deck, there are a few other uh, examples that change the example. I'm not gonna walk through them here. Uh, they're more for reference, but it's a different example of a method call. Uh, and we're in the context of a class named point, but for reference purposes, these slides are available there. So as a reminder, what are the steps that you need to take when you move through a method call in diagramming? When a method call is encountered on an object, First, the processor is going to determine the type of that object and confirm that the method exists in that class's definition, and also that the arguments of that method call agree with the parameters of that method definition. With the subtle nuance that the self parameter is not going to have a corresponding object because it's automatically uh, the name, or, or sorry, the reference of, of, uh, to the object that the method was called on. And that's what happens during the initialization step, right? So next we initialize a frame, we uh, set up the return address and the self parameter where that self parameter is assigned a reference to the object the method is called on. Finally, we jump in and when the processor returns, it works just like a, uh, a normal function call, whatever the return value is gets sent back to the caller at the return address and the con program continues on. So why have both functions and methods? Well, methods allow you to build functionality directly into your objects, right? And you've actually benefited from this. When you've used the idea of a list, you've had those methods available to you, append and pop. You didn't have to import uh, those functions from somewhere. You didn't have to redefine those functions. So what uh, methods give you are the ability to build functionality into every object of that class's type, right? We didn't have to, uh, remember or, uh, or, or go to find a different function here, uh, the idea of say hello is built into the person object. And if we were to actually um, import this class, right? So what, where we started out with at, at the early example was we started up a REPL and I said from, uh, actually we didn't start up a REPL, but let's try it here really quickly to demonstrate the benefit here from lessons.ls38methods import person Right? So I've imported this person class and notice I didn't import say hello or any function named say hello, but because I have this, I can say, okay, uh, um, foo is a variable type person that's assigned a new person object and the name will be uh, initially Chris, right? And if I say foo dot say hello, notice I didn't import that function from anywhere. It's just built into the idea of a person but because it is, it's available to me and I can start making use of that method, 
right? So when we start writing object-oriented programs and, and have classes, and these classes model not only the idea of related variables and, and attributes, um, but also some, some functionality that we know that if you're going to be working with an object of this type, you probably want this functionality built in. Methods give us the ability to do that. We'll look at, as we finish out this course, some of the differences between two paradigms of programming, and we'll spend some more time on this later on, um, but we're coming from a, a world where we've been thinking kind of in terms of functions only, right? And structuring our programs with only functions uh, available to us. And this is closer to what we might call a functional programming style. And what we're doing in this unit is looking at, well, what if we reoriented the way that we sort of frame some of our problems and model our problems around our objects and use an object-oriented approach. Both of these approaches are equally capable, um, but some types of problems are better suited for one style versus another. So when you're using functional style programming, uh, there's in your processing data, like we just did in, in some previous pro in the previous project, your data processing uh, problems are often work very well with you know stages of, of subsequent function calls doing carrying out different operations on your data and linearizing it in that way well, when you're working with stateful systems such as simulations and user interfaces so if you're building an app on your phone or, or on your computer or a game uh, having objects available to you where your objects have state and functionality built into them uh, will help you organize your program in ways that that uh, over time, people have found is a really nice way to organize your programs. So where does this name object orientation come from or object oriented come from? Well, it's the idea that when we compare uh, what we used to do, right? If we wanted to carry out the same functionality with just a function, we would have had to define a function like say named say hello. And now we're defining this function, say hello function uh, outside of any uh, class, right? This is a top level function definition. I'm just defining it really quickly in the REPL, saying uh, here's this function, and now we need to give it a parameter, right? And so our parameter is going to be uh, a person of type person, and the return type will be none, right? This is just a procedure. And the body of this will just be to print, uh, you know, uh, an F string of hello, I'm, and then we'll populate uh, this parameter a person, right? Dot name. Right, and there's my function definition. So now I can say just a plain old function call, say hello function, and I give it that person object we set up named foo, whose actual name attribute is Chris. And notice that that says, hello, I'm Chris, without an exclamation point. But if I say foo.say hello and call this method instead of using it as a function, uh, we get the method uh, evaluated that was defined as part of that class. So let me make this slightly larger and uh, talk about where does the name object orientation come from? Well, previously we were defining functions, right? And functions were given parameters or given arguments that corresponded to their parameters. And so you could say that the orientation of, of the way we were thinking about our function uh, of our programs was we were orienting them around functions, right? We were, we were thinking functions first and, and defining our functions and uh, our expressions, when we made use of them, tended to start with our functions. Well, in object-oriented paradigms, you'll see that the emphasis is really more on the objects. And so we're saying, okay, address some object and then carry out some capability in terms of that object. So the orientation is primarily or foremost on the object and then some method built onto it, rather than a function that we give an object to, right? So Here's an object that we're trying to carry out some functionality on. Here's a function that we're trying to give an object to. So it's really just an, uh, a different mindset in how we organize our programs. And we'll see that, um, again, both of these paradigms are, are entirely valid. Uh, we'll get some practice uh, with object-oriented in the, the, this unit. And we'll see that there are some places where object-oriented can really shine. This was a quick introduction to methods. Their key capability is that by defining them, you're building in functionality to every object of the class that that method is defined on. And the way that we use those methods is with the dot operator. We say object dot method name, and then we treat that as like a function call. And the big special superpower is that a method is given a reference to the object it was called on. And that's what allows it to be, uh, to reference the attributes of that object. We'll continue getting some more practice with methods and object-oriented programming in the weeks ahead.